to this uh, meeting called the NDP and the Israel-Palestine question, a former NDP member of the Ontario Legislature speaks. Uh, this meeting is brought to you by Independent Jewish Voices Halifax and Canadians, Arabs and Jews for a Just Peace. So I want to introduce our speaker today. Uh, she is Rima Burns McGowan and she was elected to the Ontario Legislature in 2018 as the NDP's only Jewish uh, MPP, uh, which is the Ontario equivalent uh, of MLA. Uh, she decided not to run again in 2022. Rima is proud of her lifelong work fighting for uh, Palestinian rights, as well as against anti-Semitism and all other forms of racism and bigotry before politics, Rima was a teacher and researcher at the University of Toronto, and she now lives by the sea. So I'm going to hand it over to Rima. Thank you so, uh, so very much, Larry. And um, thanks to every single one of you who's made it out in person on a cold day. We've been really spoiled around here. It's been warm, but all of a sudden it feels like real winter. Um, thanks to all of you who are watching online and uh, making time on a Sunday afternoon. It really, it really means a lot. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. And I'm going to, I have about 30, 40 minutes to tell the story, and then we're going to take questions. And so I'm just going to speak from my heart and tell a story. And I'm going to start out uh, with who I am. So I was born in South Africa. Uh, three of my four grandparents are Ashkenazi Jews, all of whom had come to South Africa, if not themselves and their families, escaping persecution in Europe. Um, extended family of mine perished in the Holocaust, folks who didn't make it out in time. And I know some of their names and some of their names I don't know. Uh, my fourth grandparent, my father's mother, uh, was mixed Cape colored. Uh, uh, Afrikaner, and she actually um, ended up being kicked out of her store of her family when she was young after her mother died, um, because I think the mixedness became a problem. She made it to Johannesburg, not even speaking English, and after about 15 years or so, ended up working with my grandfather, had an orthodox conversion to Judaism. and. Um, didn't speak about her origins. When apartheid came into being, her, um, her marriage would actually have been illegal. My parents left South Africa when I was four uh, to get away from apartheid. And as light as my skin is, we, we moved to Montreal, as light as my skin is, when I was growing up, I was coded black by my teachers and my classmates and their parents. So I experienced systemic anti-Black racism as well as systemic anti-Semitism growing up in Montreal. This had an enormous impact on me. And I think uh, I was told from basically the age of four onwards throughout my childhood that I didn't belong, um, that I was a Christ killer, um, that as a perceived to be black person, I was less than human uh, and I would never amount to anything. And I think the result of all of that was number one, I constantly, I'm also, I was paralytically shy. Uh, the fact that I ended up in politics still mystifies me. Um, I'm no longer paralytically shy, but I am still very much an introvert. And um, it's weird to have spent four years as an elected representative when you're an introvert. Um, uh, I spent three years living in Israel, Palestine from 1982 to 1985. I wanted to know if I would belong someplace. Uh, I certainly did feel like I belonged, but what was fascinating there was it wasn't clear to which community I belonged. When I was in very white, parts, white wealthy parts of Tel Aviv, I was constantly accosted by people asking whether I was Jewish and what I was doing there. And because Rima happens to be a, 
common Palestinian Arabic name, I was told that if I made Aliyah, I would have to change my name since I couldn't possibly live there with an Arabic name. Um, and I think that all of this really made me, number one, a social justice advocate my whole life, and number two, really think a lot about identity. So it's not surprising that after I did a, um, I went to Carleton to do um, a BA and Bachelor of Journalism and Political Science. After I lived in the Middle East, I went to, I worked in politics. Ironically, I worked, uh, I got a job first as a receptionist and then as a special assistant in the conservative government of Brian Mulroney working for the deputy prime minister because uh, Peter Harder lived next door to my parents and said, we need a receptionist. And I said, I'm not a conservative. And he said, we don't care. Something that would never happen now. Oh. <laughs> and that's where I met my husband who at the time was a progressive conservative. And so, and by the way, is the son of a Presbyterian minister. So syncretism is in my bones. <laughs> it's how I've always lived my life. I then went to Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, which is uh, actually in Washington, DC for a couple of years. And then married David, he already had two kids and then we had two more. And then I did a, a PhD at the University of Wales and ended up teaching diaspora studies at U of T and thought a great deal about how do we make Canada the tr a truly equitable society? How do we go beyond this idea of multiculturalism to create real equity and a society that really works for everybody? And um, I should also mention that when I was in Israel, Palestine, this I got there in 1982 and I lived there till 1985. And the first intifada wasn't until a few years later. And I was among a very comfortable group of progressive Jews. Do you remember the peace boat that used to be out in the harbor? Uh, who we used to go to demonstrations. We all used to wear kafiyas, like everybody, like it was a bit of a fashion statement, but it was also like a progressive Jewish thing to do. And we were trying to advocate for an end to the occupation and to the creation of an Israel that felt true to what I understood to be its Judaic roots. Um, I went to Hebrew school when I was growing up in Montreal, Temple uh, Emmanuel. And I actually was given the rabbi's cup for a paper I wrote uh, that questioned how Israel was treating Palestinians and how it was going to manage this question of Palestinian rights. And at the time, the rabbi said, that is what it means to be Jewish. And really encouraged that line of thinking. One of our best friends when we were growing up was a man who had been in Auschwitz and whose kids were our age, were, were my age and that of my brother. And um, he was, you know, the gentlest and kindest person uh, in the world. He started Holocaust education in Montreal schools. He would have been, he died of cancer uh, quite young and he would have been absolutely appalled to see the way that the Holocaust and anti-Semitism eventually became weaponized to protect the actions of the state that many Jews feel is um, taking it away from its Judaic roots. And that was a question that I had when I was there, frankly, was that how do you build, I mean, I have a PhD in international politics. And for me, that was the question nation states act to maintain and grow power. And our world, our social organization has been that of nation states since the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, which is like the only historical date I can remember. But it, it's significant because it didn't have to be that way. That didn't have to be the way that states, that human beings organize themselves in community, right? It didn't have to be. And the question really comes down to how do you create a state which is an organization intended to, 
create and maintain power that is true to a faith that is supposed to operate on ethical and moral principles. And it's a real question. And when I lived there, there were so many folks who were trying to figure out how to create a state that really was a light unto the nations, that really did answer the question of how to live differently and how to create a harmonious life. So I'm leaving out a whole bunch, but fast forward many years in 2017, I got a call from, um, we were by this point living in the beaches area, beaches East York, but I was living in the beaches of the beast York, beaches East York area of Toronto, which for those of you who, who know or who don't know, it's in the East end of Toronto, um, uh, right next to Scarborough and down at the lake. And it's a very long skinny riding that has, encompasses a range of socioeconomic groups from extremely wealthy to the deep, deep, deep pockets of poverty that are as deep as any pockets of poverty in Toronto. And, and we had lived there for 25, over 25 years, about 25 years at that point. And although I had done a lot of work, social justice work. I hadn't done any political organizing at all in the beaches. That was where I went to like regroup and center myself and, you know, just walk my dog and be with my kids. So I hadn't done the things that you do if you want to go into politics. I hadn't joined the student, uh, the parents council. Like I hadn't done any of that at all. So in 2017, the election was in June of 2018. In late October of 2017, I got a call from the Writing Association saying, would you consider running? And I was like, who are you talking to? I'm an introvert. <laughs> what are you talking to? What are you talking about? And I texted my husband who was like, no, 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 you need to take this seriously. And he's a, he was a good friend of um, Megan Leslie's. So he contacted Megan. And he said, uh, the next time you're in Toronto, you need to sit down with my wife and tell her why she needs to do this. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up going for um, a carrot cake at the Queen Mother uh, with Megan. And I'll never forget this. Like she was eating her, she was like stabbing her fork in my general direction saying, you need to take this seriously. <laughs> you owe it to yourself as a woman. <laughs> said, men always know only need to be asked once. Women you have to chase them down. <laughs> she said, seriously. Um, David says you'd be good at this. I know you'd be good at it. So after a, a number of weeks, I went to see the somebody who was um, very involved in the writing association, a fellow named um, uh, Anthony Shine, whose brother Jonah, so I'm saying this because it's important to know that Anthony is a nice Jewish boy, whose brother Jonah had been in the MPP for Davenport for four years. Uh, and um, and I said to Anthony, I said, so, you know, I, I support BDS, right? And he said, that's why we want you to run. We want you to run because you have been such a strong and thoughtful advocate for social justice, for all, for everybody. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Okay, if you, I mean, and, and I, I was still hesitant as an introvert, but if you know anything about introverts, and later somebody showed me a book called Quiet, if you're an introvert, this book is life-changing. Um, and it's, and one of the points that the author, Susan Kane makes is that when introverts do step up to go into politics, they do it because, they really believe that something needs to change. And they really believe from the bottoms of their hearts that, that there is a path to that change and they're willing to override their personal discomfort in order to help make that change happen. But it is never easy and it is never comfortable. And it was actually a lot of former students of mine who rallied and said, you need to do this 
they were the ones who kind of pushed and shoved me and said, you need to do this because you have all these amazing ideas of how we create an actually um, equitable society and how we go be, you know, how we close the gap between the rhetoric and the reality effectively. So they're the ones who organized. They also turned out to be among the best organizers in the country and unbeknownst to me, they'd all moved into Beaches East York and they're the ones who organized and got me elected. And I trounced the other guy, like I trounced him. There's no effectively no conservative um, presence in Beaches East York, but there was a large uh, liberal one. And um, yeah, they, they, I mean, there was a wave, but we really trounced. Um, and this was a new world to me. I knew it from having sat on the outside of it. My partner was, David was more involved in different ways. He, he eventually left the conservatives. Uh, our, one of our kids is queer and he was really upset about Harper's stance, but he ended up running um, Martha Hall Finley's or being the, the campaign chair for Martha Hall Finley when she ran for leader and eventually when she ran for, for, for parliament. So I had a pretty good sense of what went on in po politics from the outside, but being in it is completely different. Um, so that's basically who I am and how I got there and why I got there. And it's important to understand that the party had done a really pretty thorough job of going out to find folks like me to run for them. So um, as somebody who comes from a mixed race background, I was a member of the five person black caucus. There were, um, this was the first time that this had ever happened in Ontario. Uh, some of you who are watching are from Ontario and are, oh, knowledgeable about these players, but some of you are not. Um, Jill Andrew is a force of nature and she's still there. She's the MPP for um, Toronto St. Paul. And Laura Mae Lindo, who was the chair of the Black Caucus. Um, both of these phenomenal women have PhDs, these phenomenal Black women. Laura Mae Lindo is the MPP for Kitchener Centre and she's absolutely incredible. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, women. And there were loads of other um, folks who were, who came from, who are not white, who came from different backgrounds, who were all pushing together for real change. And for a party that would stand up for equitable change and for equity, and push back against a government that was making some pretty horrible policy decisions. So I, as mentioned, as Larry mentioned, I was the only Jewish MPP in this player, in this, in this uh, session. Um, and it is important because when issues came up, the party had decided already how it wanted to approach them. And these were issues that came up around Israel-Palestine and issues that came up about the, around the IHRA definition um, of anti-Semitism. And it got introduced pretty early on by the conservative government and um, our party decided that they pretty much decided the stance that they were going to take on it, which was to not oppose it. And there was a fair amount of pushback. We were told that we were not allowed to post about it. So I, it went to second reading. They decided that they weren't going to let either those of us who were adamantly opposed to it or um, pretty much anybody talked to it. And they had one person talk to it who was, um, he's an, a long time NDP MPP, uh, John Bantoff uh, of Dutch 
extraction, who was kind of Andrea's go-to person to talk about difficult things. But he's not Jewish. He has no particular connection with Judaism or with the Middle East. Um, and he spoke to it. And there, I think the, I think the, the folks who were in there ended up not voting. I think that was the decision. I, I can't really remember, but I think it, they didn't vote at all. And it was referred, it passed, of course, and then it was supposed to go to committee. And as you know, when issues, when laws are being made, there's, a, there's the introductory reading, there's the second reading debate, then it goes to committee. That's when community members get involved and groups, and then it comes back to the floor for third reading. Well, it became so apparent that the IHRA was going to be hugely controversial that in the end, the Ford government decided not to have it go to committee at all so that it wouldn't get debated because they also came to realize it wasn't going to be a slam dunk in their favor and that there were lots of lots and lots of people who had real concerns with IHRA. This isn't a webinar on IHRA, so I'm not going to go into that. You're all familiar with that, but I can answer questions if necessary, if you'd like. So, um, so they ended up passing it by uh, order in council. So it just went through. And um, the reason that I'm raising this here is that we were told again, not to post about it at all. And there was absolutely no way in this world <laughs> that I was not going to post about this. Um, as a Jew and as the only Jew in caucus, there was no way that I was gonna say nothing. So I wrote one post when it was first introduced. I wrote one post when the second reading, I remember I, I, I was at home, we weren't allowed to be in the chamber. Feel, I was feeling sick to my stomach about this. As an introvert, it's very difficult. I'm also an empath, so con confrontation is really hard for me. I, I hate being yelled at, and I hate it when people are mad at me, and I wanted to be a team player. But there was absolutely no way, God's green earth, I wasn't going to post about this. And so I posted the most compassionate thing I could post, which is that, yes, we have to fight anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is growing and it's terrifying. Actual anti-Semitism is growing for all the reasons that you all know it is. And it's terrifying, but that this is not the way to fight it. And there are reasons that it's not the way to fight it. And there are better definitions out there that more Jews have agreed on that are better ways to fight it. And both times I got yelled at for posting about it. Like I got hauled into the vice principal's office and had my wrists slapped. Um, it wasn't the only time that that happened. Like literally any time when the Gaza um, invasion happened in May of 21. I held off for a while and then I had to post. I couldn't not post about it. And once again, I got berated. I was threatened. I was told by the chief of staff that Andrea was looking for a way to get rid of me. Um, and I need to say, that it's really important to put out there that I didn't want to, I didn't want to be there having arguments about Israel Palestine. This is a provincial legislature. I was the critic for poverty and homelessness. And I wanted to be out there making real change. The situation for unhoused people is absolutely horrific in Toronto, as it is across the country, and getting worse. Um, there were things that the 
city government, the municipal government, as well as the provincial governments were doing that were actually making the problem worse. And during the pandemic, they were making the problem worse. And being able to get up in the house and talk about how all those things were connected and how they were very much connected to a lack of equity, um, how they were very much connected to the way that we don't deal properly with anti-Black racism, that we don't deal properly with anti-Indigeneity, that we never fundamentally um, dealt with our original sin as a settler nation and what we did to Indigenous peoples as a settler nation. We've never fixed that. And the way that we deal with homelessness is absolutely connected with that. And it could be fixed. It can be fixed. So being able to stand up there and saying, let me connect some dots for you was really important to you, to me. And people would come, I would notice that even the conservatives, even the ministers, when I stood up and I started to talk, would put their phones down and listen to me. And later they would say, I learned something every time you stand up. And I know because I've heard it again and again from the speaker and from the president of the treasury board and from various cabinet ministers who said to me, I love listening to you talk and you're really making a difference in here. You're changing the way that we have these discourses. So I know that what I was doing on the literally on the issues that I was elected to work on by connecting dots between equity and how it shows up in healthcare, in education, in housing. That was my passion. That was why I was there. I also didn't want to be talking about a conflict halfway around the world. And one of the things that the chief of staff would keep saying to me was, well, if you care so much about international issues, you should be federal. Like, why, what are you doing here? But it was his inability to understand or unwillingness to deal with the fact that even though this is an international issue and we were a provincial body, this issue is not only going to stay in the realm of international politics. Heck, it's now down to the school board level. And it's there for a reason. It's for a reason that we're having these conversations at the school board level, at the municipal level. You can't ignore it. And yeah, it's hard to be on the pointy end of history. It's really hard when history comes to find you as a legislator and says, you have to take a stand on this issue, even if you don't want to, even if you want to be dealing with potholes. Too bad you're going to have to take a stand on this ethical issue because it's come to find you. And that for me is the crux of the issue here. So yes, I pushed back and it was really, really, really hard to do that. And I have to say that for me, the huge takeaway from this is I don't care whether you don't want to deal with this, you need to. And it's not enough you know, I, I will never forget a caucus meeting when something was coming up and it wasn't IHRA. It was, it was something that one of my colleagues had gotten into by defending a constituent of his. And it had resulted in phone calls from annoyed constituents in various parts of the province. And the caucus wasn't listening to my colleague. And so I said, look, I have some background. I live, I'm Jewish. I lived in Israel, Palestine. For what it's worth, I was married to a helicopter pilot for a short time. Um, and I have some history here. And I've been keeping up with this issue. And I can unpack some of the contradictions that you're all dealing with. And I will never forget, at that point, a very powerful MPP who did not run for leader, but was expected to, said, I don't care. I don't care. I just want the phone calls to stop. And I am here to tell you, what kind of response is that? I don't care should never be the response of an elected 
member of legislature ever. And I don't care if it's an obscure to you ethnic conflict taking place halfway around the world. It's come to find you. You need to understand it. And you need to understand not just not just the line that certain organizations that claim to speak for the Jewish community want you to hear. You need to understand the politics behind that. You really need to understand it. Anti-Semitism is hard. And so many of us are traumatized. I'm sitting here today and it is hard to be here. All of my PTSD was triggered because this was really hard. It was really hard to have a non-Jew who knows nothing about this, tell me to be quiet about this. And frankly, for what it's worth, I consider that to be anti-Semitic. If you're not Jewish, don't tell Jews how to talk about anti-Semitism. Just don't do it. And when I suggested that to him, he pretended to be you know, hugely insulted, but he continued to do it. I don't care if this is hard. You have to learn to understand what anti-Semitism is and what it isn't. And you have to learn to understand what the politics are around the way that it is being used and how it's actually happening and how to differentiate among those things. And yes, it's difficult and it's gonna take you hours of intellectual time. Too bad, it's come to find you. You have to find, you have to be able to do it. And it is a cautionary tale as Israel particularly now, has this new government. This is going to become more and more and more pressing, not less. And it is ironic that one of the reasons that I left in the end had to do with actual anti-Semitism that the party managed to stumble into more than once. So because it wasn't willing to do that homework, because I kept getting, I don't care, I don't want to know, just shut up and let us make the decisions and don't talk about it. That's our way through it, is not to talk about it because that was the response. They also kept stumbling into actual anti-Semitism and actual hurt. So when the order and council uh, decision became public for IHRA, the Ontario NDPs put out a statement that said that effectively I said, let me help you put the statement out. But of course they didn't, they didn't want to hear from me. So they put a statement out that effectively said that there had been secret cabals of organizing going on behind the scenes. And of course that trips into a terrible trope and they had to take that down really fast. And then about a year ago, at the end of January, I was on the phone with a, I, I'll never forget, it was a Tuesday. And I read a really obscure article in the Toronto Star. It, it was one of those things that was buried, like really, really, really buried deep down about how the person that the NDP had nominated as the candidate in a town east of Toronto when he was the mayor had named a street after a Nazi and they had nominated him as a star candidate and they were promoting him as a star candidate but he'd named a street after a Nazi and not only had he named the street after the Nazi but years later like two years ago so I think that happened in the 2000 thoughts and then two years ago He's no longer mayor and a rabbi, a Holocaust survivor and another community member all go to city council to say, could you please get rid of this? Can we change the name? Like it's been a while now. Can we just please change the name? And this guy comes back to city council to talk over them, to tell them that, no, 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 it's cool. We should keep the name. And so I was flabbergasted. I was absolutely flabbergasted. And so I tweeted, I don't know who needs to hear this. It is never okay to name a street after a Nazi. 
And I didn't mention the guy and I didn't mention the town, but I was on the phone with a reporter talking about a homelessness issue when my other phone starts ringing off the hook. And he says, do you need to get that? And I was like, no, no, I don't. Because of course it was the chief of staff calling to scream at me and I wasn't gonna pick up. And eventually he sent one of his underlings who then tried to tell me that it was fine. It was fine that this happened because he'd apologized. He hadn't apologized. What happened was the party knew about this history and they had him at the nomination meeting get up and say that kind of non-apology that's like, I'm really sorry if you were offended. I mean, uh, you know, that thing that's actually not an apology at all. And she was like, no, he's apologized. I'm like, no, no, he hasn't. And frankly, I said, if you guys don't get rid of him, you don't deserve to run a grocery store, much less the profits. <laughs> And I wouldn't take my tweet down. And so on the Saturday morning, so that was Tuesday, on the Saturday morning, Martin Redcone, who is the Jewish columnist for the Toronto Star, wrote a story about this and quoted my tweet. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't just mine, Jill tweeted as well. And she's in Toronto St. Paul. So she has very, so she's a queer black woman, dark skinned and big boned. The amount of overt anti-blackness that Jill experienced in the chamber, never mind on the street, in her constituency, but in the chamber is disgusting. And it was something that none of the other black folks in the room experienced to the, in, to the extent that Jill did. And she also would regularly be accused of anti-Semitism. But she also tweeted after she quote tweeted my tweet, the two of us. And after Martin's piece went out across the country, that then all hell broke loose. People started canceling their memberships, started calling Andrea, and by Monday he was gone. But Balagus the chief of staff was still furious with me. And at this point, they put me in the penalty box for good. Now it wasn't the last, it wasn't the first time I was in the penalty box. I'd been there before. One of the times he put me in the penalty box was because they, there was a debate going on about some awful bill where, without going into all the details, because that'll take another 10 minutes. Um, the conservatives were trying to do a favor for a man who'd contributed a lot to Ford's campaign, but who was uh, queer phobic um, and homophobic and Islamophobic expressly, and I think is anti-Semitic as well. And the, the members who were being questioned about it kept saying, well, it's just this technicality. They were saying, yes, we're supporting it on a technicality. And so in question, I said, I quoted Hannah Arendt because that's what literally what it was reminding me of. And I had this, uh, Sam Oosterhoff, who was the um, homeschooled only to the end of high school, didn't go to university, stand up and scream at me for calling him a Nazi. And I was like, I didn't call anyone a Nazi. So I get hauled into Balagus's office and he says, you called him a Nazi. And I said, go read Hansard. I quoted Hannah Arendt. He said, who is that? I don't know who that uh, is. Uh, so yeah, this man who, whose ignorance about Jewish history, the Holocaust is so <laughs> profound. Um, telling me how to talk about anti-Semitism and how not to talk about it. And then penalty boxing me because I was like, yeah, no, 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 no. We are not having a man who named a street after a Nazi run for this party. That is not happening. One of the reasons that I left was because it became apparent to me I was never going to get out of that penalty box and he was never going to let me 
speak to a bill again, any bill. And it's one thing when the folks who are performative about equity are the conservatives, you expect that, that's not surprising. While they're, at, they're saying there's no room in this party for blah, 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 but then they're actually passing bills that are making things worse. You expect that, but you don't expect that from the party that is claiming that is progressive. And the thing that I wanna emphasize here, I mean, this issue, trust me, it wasn't only about Judaism or anti-Semitism. It happened with regard to anti-Black racism. It happened with regard to Islamophobia. It happened over and over and over and over again. Um, and I can give you examples of those. But for me, this is the real problem that we're facing now. We're looking at democracy in peril because the parties that are meant to be the parties of equity are not doing their job of being real and serious about these issues. And they are being as performative as the parties that are not supposed to be the parties of equity or progressivism. And we can't afford to have that happen. We simply can't. So for me, this is a cautionary tale. And the takeaway is you have to know what this is all about. You have to learn, even if it's uncomfortable. And then you have to figure out where you stand. And then you have to put yourself in that uncomfortable place of standing up for what's right. And one thing that I will say, the other thing that I think is a huge takeaway is regardless of my headbutting within the party, I got grudging respect from the folks on the other side. It became impossible, in fact, for the conservatives to attack me in the way that they had attacked me at the beginning. Because in the first election, of course I got attacked. I got hugely attacked. I was attacked as anti-Semitic in the sun. And, you know, Sue Ann Levy went after this list of radicals in the NDP, and I was on their list of radicals. But at a certain point, that didn't resonate anymore. Number one, because we know that a tremendous number of Jews, never mind non-Jews, are actually really concerned about what's happening in their name in the state of Israel. And we know that that's a huge issue within Jewish communities and within Jewish families. We know that there, there simply is not a family that doesn't have difficult conversations on Shabbat. We know that that happens. And also because I stood up against anti-Semitism, and there were more cases that I, I haven't named here, where the conservatives were openly anti-Semitic, and I would go and say, here's the thing that happened today. This is anti-Semitism. It's not okay. And so because I stood up so strongly against anti-Semitism, it became, and because I am Jewish, it became increasingly difficult and the attacks pretty much stopped. So the thing that I wanna leave you with is that even though it is hard, if you stand up and say the right, say the things that are right, that we need, we can't fix anti-Semitism in a vacuum. We can't fix hate unless we attack all of it. So yeah, we have to fight every instance of anti-Semitism when it rears its ugly, horrible head. We also, have to fight Islamophobia. We also have to fight anti-Black racism. We also have to fight all other forms of discrimination and bigotry. Equally hard. And, they, and we have to name them because we have to be specific because they rear their ugly heads in very specific ways. And we have to name what those are. But we cannot attack any one of them unless we attack them all. And by doing that and standing up just very consistently, I understand that my identity is complicated. It's more complicated even than I've laid out to you today because at a point I had, and I just wanna get this out on the table too, 
I was, I've always been a person who's deeply spiritual. I was really upset that there was no synagogue that I could find that I could go into and speak with the divine without this issue coming up. And I found this like really lovely queer masjid that my friend El Farukaki and Troy Jackson and Lori Silver, whose dad was Jewish, uh, all started. And I embraced Islam as well, not to turn my back on Judaism, but as like a layer to the onion. Like I can be a Jew who also embraces Islam. And as no contradiction there, as my granny used to say, there's only one divine and she doesn't care what kind of a building you go into to talk to her, which is how I've lived my life. And I understand that politics is a game where people want to pigeonhole you. And because I was the only Jew, I was the one who was out there on International Holocaust Remembrance Day talking about the Holocaust. I was the one talking about all of these things. I was their token, but I also demand real. And I think I was actually doing politics differently. I think that was threatening to people who only want to be there for power. But I think when you step up to do this, you have to decide why are you there? And people respond positively when you're there for the right reasons. After four years, I'd had enough and I wasn't going to get knifed in the back anymore by the folks who were supposed to be my friends on the <laughs> side. So I, you know, decided this introvert has had enough. But I haven't stopped fighting and I'd like, you know, I will keep fighting in my introvert way in the background. And for anybody who wants to step up, I will be there supporting, but you have to be real. And this is a difficult issue, but history's come to find us and we have to step up. Okay, I think I've gone on long enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rima. And uh, before I uh, go to the Q&A, um, and I'm just going to say a couple of things about the question and answer period. Uh, there are two ways in which the webinar audience can participate in the Q&A. Of course, in our live audience, people will stand up and we do have uh, a loudspeaker here. So we're going to have to ask people who want to ask a question live to speak into the microphone so that the people on the web can hear you. We've run into that problem before. But there's two ways in which the webinar audience can participate. I don't want you to ask questions in chat because that's too many uh, loci for me to keep a check on. But there's two ways in which you can ask a question or make a comment. One of them is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can click. Uh, where you, you can raise your hand and your hand will go up and I'll see it. And then I can actually unmute you and you can say something. Uh, now, that said, we have a fairly large webinar audience and I caution people that your right to speak is limited. Uh, if you become abusive, I will simply cut you off and remove you from the webinar. So that's a, a caution out there. You're able to ask a question, you can disagree, but uh, be fairly quick and smart about it. And uh, the second way to ask a question, if you're shy or if you have to leave, but you want to leave a question behind, is go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, click Q and A, and I will try and, and get to those. But before we move on, I just wanted to give you an opportunity you, you left it out, and I'm wondering whether that was on purpose, but there's this whole controversy surrounding Joel Harden, a fellow MPP in Ontario. And I wanted to give you a chance to just comment that on that, if you want now, rather than perhaps waiting for a question from our audience. Sure, so I'm, I'm uh, completely happy. I didn't leave it out on purpose. I just, there was so much I could have 
we would have been here all day. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, Joel is a person who's been outspoken. He's the MPP for Ottawa Center. Um, it's an area that has a significant uh, Arab and Palestinian population as well as Jewish population. And Joel um, has been an outspoken um, advocate for taking Palestinian rights seriously from before he was elected. And I was actually referring to an, uh, a controversy that he had got into when I mentioned um, the situation in caucus without going into specifics about what specifically what was what was said. But the issue here is that the, the, um, the pro-Israel lobby organizations have had their sights on Joel for quite a long time because he defended Khalida Jarrar, who is the parent of the mother of one of his constituents. Um, and because of various comments that he had made indicating that he um, was sympathetic to Palestinian rights. So they were looking for him to set, step a foot wrong. And because he's not Jewish, um, it's easier for them to go after Joel than it was for them to go after me. Um, and so um, a few, a little while ago, in, was it November? I think this all happened. Um, Joel said something that it, he had an interview a year ago uh, that was clipped and made public on Twitter in November. And the clip, the, per, the, per, the person had asked Joel a question in a leading kind of a way. And if Joel had been thinking more quickly on his feet in that moment, he would have said, I reject the premise of your question. And he would have turned this ar around and, but he didn't. And as he answered the question, he made it sound, it sounded from the clip as though he was talking to Jewish constituents in a way that, may, that held them accountable for the actions of the state of Israel. And the first rule of doing, of talking about people in Canada, all of us come from somewhere else. And we're all members. If you're not indigenous, you're diasporic. So all of us are members of diasporic communities in different ways. And then it's a question of why some of us feel diasporic and some of us don't, but that's another issue. But you never ever hold a member of the diaspora responsible for something that a nation state is doing. You just don't do that and you don't make it sound like you do. And you, if somebody puts you a question that way, you reframe the question. So it doesn't sound like you're falling into that trap. Joel kind of fell into that trap. And then of course, folks who had been looking for a way to trip him up were very happy to blow that up and say, look, he's anti-Semitic. Never mind the fact that that conflation of the diasporic community with the state had been done gleefully by many of these same organizations, but that's another issue. That's their own, you know, hypocrisy. But Joel had fallen into that trap. And so then what happened was eventually the NDP, um, as a, you know, it, they were really calling for Joel's blood. And it was actually, it was actually looked, it, it, it was a very, very unpleasant few days. And Peter Harder, who, Peter Harder, sorry, Peter Tabins, who's the uh, interim um, leader, because uh, of course, Andrea stepped down and there was only one person who stepped up and she won't be acclaimed until um, February. So Peter Tabins as interim leader um, had to deal with that. And the way that he did was saying, okay, 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 we're all going to get educated on that, on anti-Semitism. Um, but the problem is that while they have gotten educated on anti-Semitism, they have not been educated on the politics of the IHRA versus other definitions. And they haven't been told 
that as of the last survey that I think was officially done, at least a third of Jews mentioned that they were critical of the IHRA, and that number has probably gone up considerably since then. So some of that, um, anyway, that's why I say it's important to be fully educated. And also, the other problem is, as uh, IJV's report on the silencing that happens that Cheryl Nestel and uh, Rowan Godet did, um, shows that, that this is exactly the kind of thing that causes people to be quiet. And it's, you know, we just saw what happened at Harvard University where the head of Human Rights Watch has been denied a fellowship there because Harvard Center for Human Rights said, well, we're not, you know, said that they had word from donors that there would be donations canceled. That's how silencing happens. And one day history is not going to look kindly. But it, so again, my point is that Joel's, Joel is now, well, I don't want to speak for Joel, but I think it was, it was frightening for him. And this is how these groups work. And is it going to be easy for Joel to step up and, and defend his constituent's mother again? I don't know. Or is he just going to say, you know what, it's too much? Because it takes a toll. Uh, Joel is, unlike me, comfortable with pushing back at confrontation. Um, but it takes a toll. It just take, it takes a toll. It's really, really, really hard. And this is why I think it's so important for the NDP to every party at every level, like educate yourself on anti-Semitism, on the politics of how anti-Semitism is used, on the various definitions and why they're there, and then have the back of your people and have the knowledge to back that up. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to- uh, Is that what you want? Go to, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna go to David. Um, I'm not gonna, uh, when I recognize people in the webinar audience, I'm just gonna do that by first name. If you want to identify yourself, you can. So uh, go ahead, David, uh, you may have to unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, hold on, I'm just trying to uh, speak okay. again, David. Can you hear me as I'm talking here? Uh, hello, everybody from Breda in the Netherlands. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Larry, thank you for taking my question. And Rima, um, thank you for your presentation. So I, I have a question following up on what you just said. So it's <clears throat> according to the IHRA working definition, it's it's anti-Semitic to, <clears throat> to suggest um, to, to impute responsibility on, on Jewish people you know, or your, your Jewish next door neighbor or whoever um, regarding the behavior of the state of Israel. It's, it's considered anti-Semitic to suggest that just Jewish people, Canadians, are responsible for what the state of Israel does. But <clears throat> on the other hand, Canada's leading Zionist organizations, I won't name them, um, they they claim that the vast majority, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, the vast majority of Canadian Jews are Zionist. I think that's what the, the folks at CGEN B'nai B'rith say, if I'm not mistaken. Certainly, they say that the vast majority of Canadian Jews are deeply attached to the state of Israel, have a love for Israel, are attached, and so on and so on. I mean, I, I'm paraphrasing. And, and at the same time, a Jewish person like me who criticizes the state of Israel, I get accused of being a self-hating Jew. I've been char I've been accused of being a capo. I've been called a capo. So my question to you, Rima, is are we Jews, Canadian Jews, in a bind? On the one hand, well, you know, we, we, the, the, the Zionist organizations say we, we love Israel. But on the other hand, anybody who suggests that we have any responsibility or 
you know, are are anti-Semitic. So I consider this to be a liability. Can you comment? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to comment. I mean, there was a case uh, I remember, and I can't remember. It was a it was a conservative uh, member of parliament who spoke about a case um, where a an Orthodox family were walking at Canada's Wonderland, and um, somebody they they were yelled at by passers by for something that had happened in Israel or something that Israel had done. And of course, that's that's anti-Semitic. Like it would be Islamophobic to yell at a woman in hijab for something that Saudi Arabia did. Like it, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And of course, it's, it's a racist thing to do. Um, I think that that's, but this is why I'm imploring us all to be educated so that we can talk about these nuances. Look, I spent three years in Israel, Palestine. I love Haaretz. I want Israel to be the best version of itself. It is a settler colonial project, but that doesn't mean it couldn't be a good version. Of that does, doesn't mean it couldn't find a way to be an equitable place where everybody has their rights respected and it can work to get there. And it, yes, that's not easy, but it can happen. You can love a place and want it to be better. And that doesn't mean that you become, um, that you think that what it's doing is okay when what it's doing is clearly uh, an abrogation of human rights, right? Like you can be, you can be all of those things. On top of that, it's complicated for most Jews. My father, as a for instance, is somebody who is not a member of IJV. When I started tweeting, he's like, oh my goodness, do you have to be so loud? <laughs> can't you just shut up? <laughs> like, I understand how you feel, but can't you just shut up? <laughs> now he's louder, but among a very little circle of friends, I think my father's not alone. Does my father feel complicated? He does not, he would never have, when we left South Africa, there's no way my dad would have moved to Israel. He would never have moved there. Why? Because he could see these problems coming. Loving, wanting a place where Jews can be safe, believing that Israel can be that place, wanting Israel to be better, those are not contradictory things. No, you shouldn't hold people responsible. Of course not. You wouldn't hold anybody responsible for what a nation state has done. Does that answer your question? Okay, uh, we have two questions from our live audience and I'm gonna uh, just repeat, I'm gonna ask you to speak into the microphone so that the webinar audience can hear you. So Judy, can you get Jackie? Uh, we'll go with Jackie first and then Daphna. Or it, it may reach. And you have to. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you so much. It's really, I'm sure it's really hard to talk about these very intimate personal issues on a big scale. Um, what I'm interested in is the internal structure of how the NDP operates in Ontario. And so I sort of have two questions or three. One, how many members of the NDP caucus are there? Two, were these issues ever brought up at the provincial council and debated there? Not by you necessarily, that, that that's your job, but were they debated at the provincial council level? And number three, when all of this was happening to you um, by the leadership, people, whatever, were you getting any support from other caucus members? Thanks. Um, those are all really great questions. So in the uh, parliamentary session that I was there, there were 40 of us. Um, and now that it's down to 31. And there's and because Andrea has resigned, there is about to be a um, 
uh, uh, an election, a by-election in Hamilton Center. And by the way, the woman who is stepping up to run Sarah Jama is fire and she deserves support from everybody. She's incredible. Um, uh, there were times when people tried to raise it at provincial council and the um, leadership did everything that it could to make sure that that discussion never made it to the floor and they shut it down very quickly. So there were folks, there are members of IJV, there are really fantastic thoughtful folks who did want these issues to come to the floor and it, it was shut down every time and it was deliberate and you you could see the, the the tactics that were used to make sure that this never came up but it never it there was never allowed to be a fulsome conversation mm -hmm. and frankly that was true nationally as well mm -hmm. um and then the other in, in federally federally sorry yeah, federally as well. Um, and then you, the third question is, yes, I had a lot of support. And that's because um, among many members of caucus had very, um, the, the mail into their offices was running absolutely, you know, the usual suspects raised the usual concerns. And then there were loads of people who would come and say, you know, actually, it's really important for you to mm -hmm. to to not back the IHRA, and this is why. And so they were getting that those sorts of things. So I had all kinds of people, and it's really interesting. Had there been a vote in caucus, I'm not sure things would have gone the way that they did. Yeah, there was lots of support for the position that I held, and. I sent actually a long email around to everybody saying, let me give you some background. <laughs> and I just wrote this little, you know, academic <laughs> thing of here's the, here's what you need to know about this. They didn't want us sending that stuff around. Thank you. Our next question is from Daphna. Yeah, please. Uh, there is a pretty long cord, but I don't think it can reach over there. And I'm hoping um, if our webinar audience can, and you can use the chat to tell me if you can hear these questions from our, our live audience, I would appreciate that because we can try and uh, make it a bit louder. Tom? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that was really interesting. And I admire you for your stamina and uh, sort of convinced me why I would only ever go into politics. But I, something you just said, um, sort of, I'm from Israel. So something you just said is a little colonial sexual, um, project and that you think it could be a good project, that it could end up being the best. I think that there's an inherent contradiction between being a democracy and being defined as a Jewish state, which will never allow that to happen. So I just wanted to say that because I know that your heart's in the right place, but I think that those of us who were in Shalom Achshav and Shalom and all of them who fighting this battle since I, I was a soldier in the Six Day War, and since then I have been fighting this battle. And I don't think there is a better version of what it is. I think, in fact, it's deteriorated into the point of total chaos, but that's just my opinion. So, so Daphna, I don't disagree with you that if it continues to go down that road of it's a Jewish state and it, it can only be a Jewish state, then there is no way to square that circle. I think you'd have to redefine who the state was for and how. Like you, I think you can have a state that says this is a safe place for everyone who lives here. I think you could do that. I don't know if human nature will let us get there. And I think that those of us who marched for Shalom Achshav uh, were perhaps naive. It's, I, 
I won't say that I'm surprised that it ended up where it did, but I'm sad. And I'm grateful that those of us who fought for it to be different um, did fight. I think though that it's really important too when we think about what kind of society we're creating here, we have, it is also a settler colonial state founded on gruesome, excruciating and ongoing violence against indigenous and other peoples. I think we can take enormous steps in the right direction. And I think that it's possible, but harder in a place like Israel. Okay, now I'm gonna uh, read out a, a question from the uh, Q&A. Uh, and this is another David who can identify uh, himself if he wishes. Uh, Rima, when you say the party had already decided, who is this? This continues to happen, that hidden hands determine what the ONDP does, who are they? How can this be influenced? And then the, the final part of this question repeats what a number of other people in the Q&A are asking, and what are your expectations in this regard for Marit Stiles as leader? <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so when I say it had already been decided, it was the leadership that had decided what it was that they, the stance that the party was going to take. And this happened all the time, like um, that there were no votes taken in caucus as a, on the direction that the, the leadership decided what it was going to do. And frankly, provincial council was never gonna make a difference. It was never gonna make a difference. Um, and I think that that's because it was the, the governing idea, the idea behind it all was to, how do we get through this to raise the fewest, the least amount of fuss. Like what is the path of least resistance through all of this? Not what is the right path? What is the one that's gonna get us to the place that's the most moral that puts us in? And it comes from, a, I think a way of, and, and frankly, we could be talking homelessness and we'd be in having the same discussion, right? So, and that's, and I think that that's, and we could be talking about anti-Black racism. I can tell you stories about what happened after George Floyd. We would be having exactly the same conversation. It's how do we have, how do we raise the least amount of controversy as opposed to what is the stance that is the the one that pushes us as a party and us as a province and us as a country in the right direction. And then trusting that that, that that braver stance will actually pull in people who are right now going, oh, I'm not gonna bother because what's the point? And so that it's that lack of, being willing to stand up and saying, this is the right thing to do. And I trust that it is going to pull people. And I know that it works. I saw it myself. I, I was telling um, Gary, who's here, that I also went and stood at encampments when in the summer of uh, 2021, when John Tory was sending increasing numbers of police into them. Um, and I was the only person who was there. Um, and I know that there were people who came to me and said, I've never, we as a group, we, uh, uh, we've never been willing to help a politician, but you're different. We will help you get reelected. And when I decided not to run again, they disappeared. And there is no NDP, MPP in Beaches East York now. 
and it that it did I it would have run again. I would have won if I had run. Um, and and there were people who just were like, well, why would we bother? When you stand up and you take the brave stances that are the right stances, people people rise. And so I think that's the that's where the opportunity lies. And I can't answer your question about Marit because I think she has, I don't, I don't know because I don't have a crystal ball. And I I think that these are the the sort of frankly existential questions that um Marit has to answer. Is she going to be a different version of Andrea or is she going to take these bold stances? I don't know the answer. I do know that Sarah Jama, who's running in Hamilton Center, who's a um, Somali Muslim Black disability activist, I do know who uses a who uses a chair and when she gets elected, she will get elected. They're going to have to actually bring accessibility for the first time to the legislature. But I also know that Sarah can't be intimidated. So, and I, you know, so these are the, these are decisions that Marit's going to have to make. Okay, the, we have a, a live question here, and I just have to remind uh, uh, the live audience that some of the webinar people couldn't hear you, uh, couldn't hear a couple of the questions that were asked uh, in the past, so they've just uh, told me. So Val is next, but Val, you have to hold the microphone pretty closer and speak much louder, and we'll hope they online audience can hear better. Hi there. Um, do you want to check and see if they can hear me? Okay, let's see what they have to say. Sounds great. Okay. Good. Perfect. Um, uh, I'm Valerie Johnson, and uh, thank you very much for sharing your story and your courage. Um, yeah. Um, I want to return to the settler colonial project um, and to suggest the possibility that um, the settler colonial project and the political economy that's linked with it um, is worth centering in our consideration of strong political support for the state of Israel and its occupation. Um, and that while the influence of Jewish people is part of the picture that the settler colonial project and the political economy that this nation and the United States are centrally founded on, um, we cannot understand uh, settler colonialism here and in Israel without centering that political economy. And also that that is a white dominated project. And so as a scholar of whiteness and of settler colonialism, I also have to, and I'm, you know from lived experience, the centrality of white supremacy and anti-black racism and colonialism at that set of projects. And I'm reminded in your story that South Africa built apartheid by learning from settler colonialism in Canada. So yeah, I just wanted to raise that and, and ask you to speak a little bit about that. Thank you again. Val, thank you so much for that uh, question. I think you're absolutely right. You're a hundred percent right. And I can't agree more. And I think that it speaks to, it reinforces the fundamental point that I'm trying to get across here, which is that 
I don't care whether this appears to political party strategists to be an international issue forcing itself on a provincial issue. You know, over and over again, I got told, um, we just want to talk about housing, education, and healthcare. Like, that's all we want to talk about. And the pro Ontario will be so much better off if we're elected next time. And at one point, I was told, we can't solve, you know, racism in the next 18 months. So just shut up and let us, you know, just echo what we say and let us be elected and things will be fine. The reason that I think your analysis and the question that you're getting at is so crucial is that how do we do we come at government in an intelligent, compassionate, equitable way at any level if we're not willing to have those conversations? So yes, we need to have them. We need to have them in deep and nuanced ways. We need to make sure that we are putting together political parties that are a willing to actually have these conversations and you don't have to have a phd or be a researcher in order to to think thoughtfully about these issues and all of their ramifications but we can't move forward if we have people who are refusing to think about it, even when they have caucus members. And there were, the, I can think of 10 of the 40 of us who would have been able to contribute, never mind, you know, without outside thoughtful influence, but 10 of the 40 of us would have been able to have thoughtful conversations at a really sophisticated level of exactly the topic that you've raised. So you can, we can't create we can't create public policy that is thoughtful if we don't understand the framework in which it's happening. And we how do we get there when we have leaders and operatives who are who are not even willing to to go there, not even in back rooms, not even in off time, not even to like. Let's have a half a day and just have that conversation. Have it out. So yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm going to recognize recognize somebody from the uh, webinar audience now. This is David M, and I thought I had clicked him, but I got David K last time. So hopefully, this is David M, and. Uh, Ah, yes, it is David M. Okay, David, go ahead. Uh, you ha may have to unmute yourself. I've unmuted myself, but I'm not David M. Oh, there's a lot of people posing as David M. <laughs> In fact, it says on, on our screen, David M. Oh, well, okay. Go ahead. You want the question? Sorry. We had trouble with the link, and David Mivisair was kind enough to send the link to a number of us. Uh, oh, because okay. we never got the, we ne the webinar never sent Isn't sent out like link. I am Spartacus moment. Yeah, we're all David Mivis. As it turns out, I'm another David from London, Ontario. It's a troika okay, of Davids okay. online from Breda to London. Anyway, uh, thank you, Rima, for sticking it out as long as you did, and thank you for your frank uh, presentation today. Even which went into more detail than you were able to before, even though there are a lot more sort of details. Um, about the, you just mentioned the operative. So I'm less interested in the change from Andrea to Marit than in the departure, thank the divine. I think we all need to quote your granny widely about the one divine, even though I'm an atheist, I think that's a very apropos quote. Thank the divine, um, Balagas has departed. Um, is there any hope that the apparatchniks that crushed the debate at provincial council? One of the members from London's uh, North Centre was one of the people who actually got on the record before that was all went sideways and the, and the debate was crushed. Um, is there any hope in the procedural stuff? So the structural stuff, which keeps the debate from happening, which I I don't think is actually about the named elected people. I think it's about party structures and I'm relatively pessimistic about them changing. I'm just wondering on your take about the structures that prevent the grassroots 
um, from debating these issues and bringing them up because the experience, and I'm, I said from the, the IJV, uh, no IHRA committee, when there's a public debate, it usually goes in a good direction. It's the suppression of thoughtful debate, which favors the status quo and favors the establishment organizations. So is there any hope at that level, sort of the structural level of the party actually allowing uh, a real debate now that thank the divine Balagus has departed? Thank you. And um, yeah, it's David Heap in London, Ontario. Uh, yeah, thanks, David. Um, thank you so much for that. Yes, thank the divine. He has departed. I think, though, there are lots more where he came from, unless the party, unless the party is really convinced that its future lies in a different direction. So, and I, frankly, I think that provincial council as it is structured at the moment is a dog and pony show. And if you are relying on provincial council for actual change, you're looking in the wrong place. By the time you get to provincial council, it's already set. And it's all a question of having the show play out. So I think that the change has to happen in the background now at every level um, where there needs to be pressure and i think part of the trouble is that people are simply sitting it out they're just they throw their hands up and they won't do anything or perhaps they believe that provincial council is real but it isn't real it doesn't matter whether it's and and in fact the, the switch to online made it easier for them to control not harder so it just became easier because there was no chance of um, like the there was no chance of the surprise. Like it all it there was a, the the beginning of a debate at a provincial council right before COVID shut everything down. That would never happen uh, online. It just it never would. So I think it's really important for pressure to be put on riding associations and on the party in the background, you, you, we, we can make real change, but only if at every level, people are convinced that there's a real appetite for it. So, you know, it took two days after Martin's column about the Ajax former mayor for him to be dumped as a candidate. Um, because that pressure was there. People were quitting, people were walking away, canceling their memberships. So it can be done, but it's going to have to happen. And it's, you know, it's only when the party becomes convinced at every level that this is really necessary, that there will be change. And the other piece is that when somebody does get elected who is progressive it is really important who is actually progressive it is really important that they continue to get a lot of support and maybe there have to be structural changes um but that they get support at the riding level not just from the members of the riding association. And I was lucky. I had a great riding association that always, always, always had my back. But I know that many ridings don't have particularly organized riding associations or people who will gather around at some points, stop paying attention. And so a lot of folks who were progressive felt alone. and no way to defend themselves against a leadership that was effectively using them as tokens. Okay, Brian is next, but before you do, I'm gonna use my moderator's privilege to ask a very practical question and kind of act as devil's advocate here. When I've argued on this issue with uh, NDP stalwarts, the, the argument that I am given, which, makes some sense in a certain way. So they say, among those people 
who would possibly vote for the NDP in the next election. So they're not talking about people who would never vote NDP, but among those who would possibly vote NDP, is taking this position going to uh, lose us more votes than gain us more votes? That's the answer I get. And it's, one, it's the only one I really find difficult to argue against, except to say, oh, you're just being opportunistic. So how would you answer that well, challenge? It goes back to that idea of how big do you think the NDP universe is? Um, and I think that the NDP universe is actually significant, but because when the NDP doesn't, so when you're taking up the space, this is, this is so crucial, when you're taking up the space on the political spectrum of the progressive party, but you're not being progressive, you are actually damaging progress because there is nobody in that space. You're saying I am the progressive one, therefore you should vote for me, but my positions are not progressive. So then all the people who could vote for you would be willing to vote for you are simply going to sit home and do nothing. And I actually think that the NDP universe, in other words, the group of people who could possibly vote NDP if the NDP were actually progressive is actually really much bigger than they think it is. It, the woman who was the former, and she wouldn't mind my saying this, the woman who was the former president, she just retired as president of the Albany Club. So for those of you who don't know, the Albany Club is where the Conservative Party of Canada goes to pray when they're not in church. And you walk into that place and you cannot turn around without bumping into John A. McDonald. And the woman who was just, she served two terms. She came and she donated money to my campaign and she came and door knocked for me. I guarantee you that the people who give you that response don't put Linda or her family on the list of people who might vote NDP. But I'm telling you, that they're there. I can't tell you, I have like lists of conservatives who voted for me and came up and door knocked for me and would have voted for the NDP if we actually stood up and stood for something real. I think it's a massive miscalculation. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is we're Drawing to a close, I'm just going to take two more questions, one from Brian in our live audience and one from, and then after him, uh, from Ronnie in our webinar audience. And then I'm going to give Rima a chance to answer both of them. So we'll have both questions, one after the other. Hi, um, my name is Brian O'Neill. Rima, thank you so much for your presentation. I was moved my mind was going all over the place as you were expressing your background it's uh, it's incredible um it seems to me that what has been touched at here a little bit this afternoon is something which is an overriding issue that i have going in my mind all the time about this and this is the seeming intellectual poverty of so many conventional journalists or politicians or whatever, their intellectual poverty when it comes to dealing with this issue of Israel, Palestinian rights, IHRA, et cetera. Uh, it just drives me cracked at times. And, you know, I, I can recall different times reading John Ibbotson in the Global Mail and I'm saying, hello, it's, you know, you're talking about, oh yes, there's a, uh, a, a rampant increase in anti-Semitism and I don't doubt that, but who is doing the anti-Semitism for the most part? There are subtle expressions of this from progressive people, for sure. But there is, you know, when you see in Charlottesville uh, in the States and people are saying, Jews will not replace us. Like, that's smack you in the face kind of stuff. And this is what's going on all the time. But, and I'm trying to figure out what is, are the, are the John Ibbotsons, who is the journalist with the Globe and Mail, 
are the Chilean incidents of today still reflecting uh, and being basically hit on the backside with the guilt that pervaded Western Europe and North America towards the end of the Second World War or after the end of the Second World War when the Holocaust could not be denied. And I want to just jump into something um, that brought to my mind in, in a visceral way about that kind of uh, the subsequent guilt thing is in 1944, uh, in, uh, in 1994, I went as a member of an international development agency to a conference in Mount Washington in New Hampshire. It was a 50th anniversary of what was called the Bretton Woods Agreements, setting up the World Bank International Monetary Fund. They tried to get a, a WTO on the go to hold. But this was like the who's who trying to uh, reconstruct the global economy at the end of the Second World War, which they realized was coming up. There was John Maynard Keynes, there was Harry Dexter White, there was Louis Rosminski from Canada, soon to be a governor of the Bank of Canada, et cetera. Like, why was this held in the Mount Washington Hotel in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire? Well, the reason why it was held there in 1944, and not held in Washington or in LA or in New York, was because none of the large convention centers and hotels would accommodate a Jew. And Henry Morgenthau, who was the Secretary of the Treasury of the US, was Jewish. So they had to find some spot to hold this conference. Now we know in the late 1930s, the ND St. Louis was refused from going into Canada uh, at the, after the Second World War before maybe the, the guilt became more profound among the political class in Canada. There was this uh, none is too many kind of thing about taking no Jews as refugees. But the intellectual poverty of, of conventional media and politician, the political class, isn't this the kind of thing that drives you crazy to them, Okay, and then we're gonna take the question from Ronnie, and then we'll let... Uh... Ah, Ronnie, I have to promote you temporarily because you're using an older version of Zoom. I have to promote you to a panelist, which is a great privilege, but because you're the last questioner, I'm gonna do it. So just hold on a moment and you should be able to speak now. If you're there, great. You have to unmute. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Rima, I mean, you just fascinate me. I could listen to you. For, um, yeah, I, I want to bring it back to the NDP because, uh, like, you're, you're such an important, uh, you know, to have you share all this with us. We wouldn't have an opportunity with other people, right? <laughs> no other Jews there, and there's no other advocate like you. So I just wanted to ask, I mean, maybe I missed uh, one question when I had to go out for a minute. Uh, did anybody talk about uh, Jagmeet and um, how this, uh, how his, uh, you know, what he's been saying has, uh, you know, has had any, how is that playing out in the provincial, uh, you know, because when Joel Harden gets, gets punished for speaking uh, when when Jagmeet had already spoken on that, I don't. I just don't understand how that works. So if you could just give us some idea of how the uh, how the national party is taking all this and provincial, I don't know. You just tell us what you know or how you can see it. It would really be helpful, I think. Thank you. And thank you so much. Thanks, Ronnie, and, and thank you, Brian. Um, so to to Brian, to your question, I mean, I think that, of course, the that kind of guilt um, continues to linger. Um, the world behaved despicably uh, to Jews, and um, well-meaning people do not want to continue to, they do not want to either commit acts of anti-Semitism. They don't want to be seen 
to commit acts of anti-Semitism and they don't want to uh, be seen to be uncaring towards the position of Jews. So, but that leads into the same problem as before. If you don't understand what you're talking about, if you don't understand either how anti-Semitism actually works or the politics of the weaponization of uh, anti-Semitism or the state of Israel or the way the state has used anti-Semitism to its own political and power ends, if you don't know and you don't understand and you hear that there's a definition called the International Holocaust Remembrance Association's working definition, and your, your, all of your good heart tells you, this is a good thing to support, right? Who wouldn't support that? Um, and you're walking into a trap. And so this, and there's no question in my mind that there are anti-Semites who begin as anti-Semites who use um, criticism of Israel as their vehicle to be anti-Semitic. Of course that happens. So not to acknowledge that is also problematic, right? But um, this is why it takes a long time to educate the public and to educate public discourse enough that all of these folks can have this conversation at a sophisticated enough level that we can actually start to, to, to change the public consensus and then get moved to action. So why did it take so long for apartheid to be uh, globally um, dis, to be globally uh, condemned? and for action to be taken. It took decades. It shouldn't have taken decades and it took decades for that to happen. And it, it takes a long time to educate people past the position and into a new position. And yes, of course you're right. It's, the, it's those hateful, it's the hateful folks on the right who are the vast majority of, um, anti-Semites, as well as anti-Black racists, as well as transphobes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, but until you educate folks to the point where they are having this conversation in a sophisticated way, it just takes a long time. It's very frustrating. It's very frustrating. But I think that as a party, we in the NDP have no excuse. We should be leading that conversation, not lagging it. Um, and that actually leads into Ronnie's question also. I mean, kudos to Jagmeet. He took a huge step forward um, this past fall and finally started to speak in ways that were more reflective of reality and less reflective of some kind of default. I'm terrified to say this thing, mm -hmm. lest the, 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 the sky fall down on me. And it, and, it, and just on that point, it's really interesting because when I was getting all of that pushback from Balagas, like, don't talk about this, don't think about it, it's an international issue. The NDP was all over calling what happened in 1984 genocide. Why? Because they saw a clear link between calling it genocide, and I'm talking about in the Punjab, talking it, they, clear link between calling it genocide and the votes of the Punjabi Sikh community who are very organized. So, yeah. I mean, kudos to Jagmeet, took him a while. He's moving in the right direction. And I think we need to encourage, encourage that. The question of why it took so long, that's, that's a different story. <laughs> anyway, I, um, can I say something? Yeah. I just want to thank everybody um, for hanging in. This has been a thank you for your patience and listening and letting me tell that uh, somewhat convoluted story. And thank you so much for your thoughtful questions and thank you for caring. Like, thank you to all of you online and to all of you who are here. It, it, it means a lot. Um, I really appreciate it. I think.
I think we're, I think we can move this, I think we can move this ball in a really good solid direction. I am not hopeless. I am not despairing. I am full of hope. It takes, it's going to take a lot of bravery and it's going to take a lot of folks. And I think it's going to take folks who are not Jewish. It's brave to step into this because nobody wants to hurt feelings or be seen as anti-Semitic, but it's really important. It doesn't change until, it doesn't change until we all figure it out and we move together. So thank you. Thank you so much for listening and talking and engaging. I appreciate it. I just want to uh, say a couple of words. Of course, I want to thank profusely Rima Burns McGowan for a wonderful talk and wonderful answering of our of our questions. Uh, before I draw the meeting to a close, and and to say that Ontario's loss is our gain here in uh, Atlantic Canada, but through the magic of the internet, she's everybody's gain, as you've shown today. I, ju I just wanted to mention, too, that uh, when the whole thing happened with Joel Harden uh, in the ONDP, uh, I mentioned to people in the party, in the Ontario party, that uh, IJV does uh, a workshop on anti-Semitism. We've now done it for almost four years, and we've given it to all kinds of uh, groups, church groups, educational groups, trade unions, uh, faculty unions, university, EDI centers. We've become pretty good at it. Uh, it used to be just Cheryl Nestle and myself, but we have a, a whole new group of people, including Rima, who are going to be uh, helping us in the future. So if you belong to any kind of uh, organization, be it a political party uh, or whatever that wants to get get uh, a view of anti-Semitism that is out of the mainstream, but very relevant, get a hold of independent Jewish voices, please. Okay, and I'll draw this to a close. Thank everybody. Uh, the meeting today was recorded and uh, IJV will be putting it, uh, the recording online after we edit it, because I think we recorded the first half hour in which nothing happened. So thank you everybody. And have a wonderful day. <laughs>